Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, if you haven't already gotten your fine dining from Will over at our uh, uh, catering table, uh, feel free to go get some get some bread. He's made sure he's whipped up just the right thing for you tonight. Just the right thing for you. Right, Will? Shake your head, Will. Yes. Will's, Will's making sure he's got the right kind of goodies over there for you. So go grab your coffee, some bread, get yourself situated. We've got some of the other breakout groups will be coming in here shortly. But we got a lot of announcements tonight, so we're going to get the ball rolling. And on that note, my wonderful Edia, who's sitting here with her Seattle. Is that Seattle? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually where Bob Korzenewski is today. That's why he's not here tonight. So you must have been thinking of it. So, so Edie's going to start us in prayer with the t-shirt on and lets us know we're thinking about God. Good, thinking about God. Have I won way, Lord, have I won way? because we want to be supportive and encouraging. So those of you that have had an in-person interview over the last week, would you please stand up so we can give you a round of applause? Okay. Now the, the TV people that are trying to get a seat right now makes it look like we've got all these in-person interviews going on. So take a, you guys need to take a seat so we can really acknowledge the people that are really standing up about the interviews. Okay. All right, so keep standing. So those of you that had, have had an in-person interview, keep standing. We're going to add to your ranks. 
Those of you that have had a phone interview over the last week, would you please stand up so we can give you a round of applause? Great, more bodies stand up, great. Okay, next group that we're gonna add, keep standing, keep standing, standing, there we go. Uh, those of you that have at least met one other person this past week, and maybe you've connected with, on, connected with them on LinkedIn, where you think they're gonna help you with your job search, would you please stand up so we can give you a round of applause? All right. And those of you that are standing, what do we say to the people that are still sitting down? Get busy. Yeah, get to work, all right? You've got to be out there networking, right? We all know that. So, uh, uh, okay, there's one other group that we always want to acknowledge, and that's, that's, that's the group that we know uh, by their uh, red border around their name today. Those people that have decided to actually show up at CNM for the first time and brave this crazy group and... and uh, get out of their house and, and do some networking and walk into this space where we've got all these things going on, all these volunteers, all these breakout sessions, and not get, feel too intimidated. Let's make sure we give them a warm welcome, our first timers. Or would you please stand up so we can give you a round of applause? Okay, thanks for being here. All right. Now, what we keep on talking about while we have great speakers and we have wonderful volunteers, we're, we're, we're blessed with the, with the group that we continue to do this literally almost 50 weeks out of the year. Uh, one of the great benefits that we continue to get is how we support each other. And I'll tell you what, I'm feeling really good about myself tonight. Because I just got some great support from one of our attendees. First off, he's, uh, he speaks French, so he comes up to me and he says, do you know that Mal, which is by the way, for those of you that don't know, Mal is short for Mallard like the duck, that's really my first name, that Mal really means bad in French. And I said, yeah, I, 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 I did know that, Spanish as well. Uh, but then as we're talking, uh, a friend of his comes up, who's a first timer tonight, says, by the way, in Arabic, Mal means money. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, that's interesting. And then finally he sees me a little bit later tonight, and he says, we don't, you can really spin that really well. You know, bad can have a good connotation. Like, I'm bad. Right? Exactly. So I'm bad, and I'm going to make some big money. So I like my first name all of a sudden, even more so. So, see, you just never know when you come here what you're going to learn about yourself, right? It's, you know, <laughs> go figure. Okay. That was a worthwhile story to tell, right? Okay. Um, we actually have a number, you know, this is exciting to so those of you that are looking for interviews to interview for jobs. We have a number of people that came in today with job opportunities. I'm going to try to go through them. First off, we have uh, a woman. Uh, her name is Avery Blue, uh, and she's actually with the United States Postal Service. She's actually in the HR department, and they have a number of positions that are open uh, that they're, they're hiring in Northern Virginia. There's a, a table in the back of the room where she brought all kinds of flyers and so forth and uh, information about the uh, entry exam. Now, what she came to us about said that a lot of the positions that this is referring to with the stuff that she brought on the table were really entry level. But I, I said, well, what about if there are any other positions on the Postal Service website, would she be willing to be a conduit to get resumes to the right people? She called her boss on the spot and got <coughs> approval. So you still have to go to the United States Postal Service website to formally apply. That's a, a typical thing but we now have this person's contact information within the HR division that is willing to uh, carry a resume, even if you've applied formally online, to maybe get a position in the Postal Service. So uh, her name is Avery, anybody, anybody interested in this before? I, okay, so her name is Avery, A-V-E-R-Y, Avery Blue, B-L-U-E. And if you want to take down her phone number, it's 703, I'll be scrambling for paper, okay? Uh, 703-698-6641, and that's Avery Blue. I'll, I'll have this information, uh, so reach out to me, but again, if you, she said there's actually a phone number on with some of the documents back there, uh, one of her coworkers, but at least know that it's wonderful. And by the way, how she found out of us, she's an usher uh, on Sundays at the church, and found out about us and said, I need to bring these opportunities to see now. Isn't that wonderful? So, great. So uh, she's not here, she had, to, she had to move on, but so that's from Avery. And then we also have, let's see, Ed, do you want to come up and tell us, if, where's Ed? Is Ed here? Ed? No? Ed maybe has already left. I thought Ed, Ed was here and had a position for us. Well, we'll keep going in case he's out in the hallway. Um, let's see, 
Uh, Anna, you want to come on up and tell us about uh, what you what you discovered? Hi, everyone. Um, I am a uh, person in transition, or have been in transition, and I happen to be attending IT for DC earlier this evening. And uh, I spoke with a man named Devin Monroe. He works for a company called Digital Dining. And he is looking, he's the, um, he is a development manager at uh, Digital Dining. And he's looking for someone who knows C Sharp or Visual Studio, um, someone who knows web services programming. Um, and they are a company, they do uh, restaurant software. So if um, you are a programmer and have this kind of experience, um, you can let me know. Uh, I'll give you my contact information, and I'll be happy to make the introduction to, uh, to Devin um, for you. My contact information is ar at corpslaw.com. Okay, so it's ar at corpslaw.com. Okay, so hopefully there are people out there. It looks like he's really, um, you know, has a real, a real tangible opportunity. And he did share the, the pay scale with me, and it, it's attractive. Thank you very much. Are you going to try to post that on our LinkedIn group as well? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and Ed has come up. We found, we discovered Ed. Here's Ed. Thank you. My name is Ed Aguirre. Um, I'm currently working with IBM. Um, and I've come many times to CNM and had um, a great number of experiences with a lot of the volunteers. So again, thanks, Mel, and everybody else. So uh, there's some jobs with a company in um, Columbia, Maryland called Cyber Trend Engineering. Uh, I work closely with them uh, for uh, their support for the, the agency over there by Annapolis Junction. So these are these are these do require uh, an SCI clearance um, with the Lifestyle Poly. So uh, if you do have those requirements uh, or that background, uh, they're they're looking for people with experience designing, developing, implementing, supporting services for SOA um, data power appliances. So these are security related products that do things like authentication, authorization, encryption, digital signatures. These are pretty heavily in demand people, so um, if you do have those, that kind of a background, uh, this company is seeking for them, uh, looking for those types of individuals right now. But they also have um, another 30 positions for um, the classic systems engineering type, database, networking type, uh, type of individuals. So, if you have those um, those qualifications, feel free to give me a call. I'll give you my IBM email address. It's Ed Aguirre, which is A G U I R R E at us .ibm .com. Um, and um, just shoot me an email, and I can make an introduction or get to this, this information. If you know somebody else who might have those credentials, uh, feel free to have them. Thank you. We'd be able to get that on LinkedIn. Does that work for you? We'd be able to put that in our LinkedIn discussion group? Yeah. Okay, perfect. And great. These are, they were posted up on the board. They're gone now. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So just, just as a reminder, first off, what's always wonderful is when, when we have our alums come back and let us know what the opportunities are out there. We so appreciate that. Uh, so thank you, Ed, uh, and, as well. And then, Will, did you have uh, some announcements, sure, uh, some sure. job opportunities? Sure. Uh, this is more maintenance uh, jobs. If you are either young or of the young persuasion and you would like a part-time position dealing with customer service and also working on computers, just see me. There are three opportunities, two part-time, one full-time. Thanks. Well, I always like to think I'm young with persuasion, right? <laughs> I can be persuaded to be younger, okay? All right, uh, also, uh, one of our clients uh, is looking for a contract specialist. It's a part-time position. I believe they need a clearance, but I'm, I didn't give it to Tom to post, but uh, if you have experience as a, in contracting, I uh, would like to, to let me know. I've got a position uh, that with one of our clients that we're trying to get filled. So, 
Uh, on that note, we have the best part of the evening is always when we have someone who has landed. And we have someone amongst our ranks who has landed, Elena. So would you like to come up and tell us about, tell, give us your victory lap. Hi, my name is Elena. I'm focuses on helping student leaders at the university level. And my master's in, is in global health and I've worked internationally, so it's really very exciting. Um, and my position is chief operating officer. Wow. So wow. it's really exciting. Wow. So um, how I found this job was I was a, I mentioned I was working overseas and I worked um, in Burundi which is in Central Africa, and I was I had a fellowship with the Global Health Corps, um, which you may or may not be familiar with, but they send Americans and um, uh, people from other African nations to the United States and around Africa to do different um, opportunities in the community health space um, at community health organizations. And one of the other fellows that I met there, I became very close with. We had only really met each other for two weeks, and then we never saw each other again. Um, but we remained in touch, and she was a, um, she told me about this opportunity, and she, she knew me, and she thought that I would be a really good fit for it, so she kept me abreast of, of everything. And um, so uh, that's how I found out about it, and um, went out to visit her and actually got to meet everyone I was going to be interviewing with before I interviewed, <laughs> so that probably worked in my favor. Um, and yeah, so now I'll be working with a good friend of mine and a great group of, um, it's a millennials organization, so <laughs> run by a bunch of people who are younger than me, you can imagine. So uh, it should be quite interesting, I'm very excited. And I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak and um, Everything that I learned while I was here, I think one of the most important things that I learned from this um, group was, well, a couple of things. One was tell everyone you know <laughs> that you need a job. Um, I think that really worked in my favor. And then also tips and tricks about LinkedIn and networking I found to be really helpful things that I learned from this organization and um, was able to, in the meet, before I found this really great opportunity, was able to find out other things that I may or may not actually want to do. <laughs> so that was also very helpful in this whole process. So thank you to everyone who comes here and runs this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. One quick question. So how did you, so you only knew this person for roughly two weeks. Yeah. So how did you maintain that connection uh, until the time you actually got hired? You know, how did that come up? So um, we, we had, we just sort of hit it off. We just had a really mutual connection of being good friends right from the get-go. So um, she was in Uganda and I was in Burundi and we just sort of checked in every once in a while and um, when, you know, just, it's kind of really it, just checked in every once in a while and, and uh, when she came back to the United States, because she stayed in Uganda a little bit longer than I stayed in Burundi, so when she came back to the United States we started communicating by phone a little bit more, and um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and, and you let her know about your, your job hunting, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, she was well aware that I was yeah. looking for the right position. I, I had um, done, I did a couple other things. In the meantime, I had an internship with Save the Children, and I um, found a consulting opportunity with my old employer to <coughs> keep busy in the meantime, and she knew I was doing all of that, but looking for the right thing. Great. Terrific. Thanks again, congratulations. So, perfect example is you just never know on a short-term connection, right? Basically two weeks and then finding some commonality and then staying in touch. I mean, those are the things we, I mean, that's the whole point of, of LinkedIn is the idea that as updates show up and you start to remember the people you're bumping into is that you stay on their radar. And if you know people that are in your industry or you work with them or whatever and you maintain those connections, you just never know how that's going to play out. So. Congratulations. We hope to have more of you come up here and do a Victory Lab. And by the way, it, just in case you're not aware, Victory Labs don't always just have to be, I now have a full-time 
employment opportunity. If you land a contract, if it's something that is moving your career forward, we're happy to know about those steps because you know, even landing things like those contract positions that keep you busy, that's still a, a victory, that's a land, and we want to acknowledge those things because it's not always waiting for that full-time position. And uh, our focus here with each other is to continue to encourage our accomplishments as we move forward. That's why we do the who had the in-person interview and, and the phone interview as a way of encouragement, okay? All right, so now we have our, our wonderful speaker. Oh, sorry, I forgot about Bo. Bo has that. This is back to the drum roll, okay? I gotta remember now. I should remember this announcement. Here you go, Bo. Okay, this is not your normal job opportunity. We're preparing for the CNM band for the Christmas party. We are in need of a keyboard player and a guitar player. If you're interested, please see either myself, Dave Pierce, or Will Yateman, or our speaker. And we'll get, connect, get you connected with the band. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we, have, we have opportunities for all walks of life. Yes. Well, if, you, if you know somebody? Absolutely. But what do we do here, gang, that starts with an N? Network. Okay. And what does that mean? We, we, we always try to figure out who do we know that knows someone that knows someone that can get us the opportunity. Absolutely. Feel free to pass that along. Okay. So, Rob Jollis uh, came to us uh, as a good friend of Will Yateman, and I had the privilege of hearing Rob present a number of times, and we were just chatting before, that sort of the topic of the evening an evening in with Rob Jollis is probably a great way to describe the, the joy that you're going to get out of this tonight. Because Rob is, a, is just an amazing presenter. And I don't know that I ever try to force a topic on what Rob presents, because he's just, he's just a delight to listen to. So I don't know where he's going to go with this tonight. So that'll be our fun and exciting thing to experience uh, as an audience. But I know it's going to be wonderfully entertaining and instructive. So Rob, you got the stage. Thank you. First of all, I, I know it probably feels like I've spoken a whole lot of times, but I've actually spoken once. It just, it just feels like I'm around, I'm hanging around. I'm smiling because I'm stepping over here. This is a, a very unusual thing for me to do. Bo, you can go ahead and pass that out right there, that first stack. Because uh, I never have notes when I speak. But I have to tell you that I'm I, uh, not sure when we put this up, maybe five months ago or so. What do you think, Anja, about five months? And I said, yeah, okay, July one up, I'll be ready to roll. Well, all of a sudden, that the date started coming up on me, I thought, well, it's, it's great. All I have to do is figure out what's going to be our topic for tonight. <laughs> so I love the fact that it ended up with an evening with Rob, uh, which is nice. But I don't, one thing I, I, I think it's important as a speaker is that we can entertain and we can motivate and we can inspire, uh, but I want you to walk out with some concrete thoughts that are going to help you become more successful. And that's the, that's the big thing. So you're going to be seeing a, uh, a little survey that's coming out, questionnaire. And it's, um, I kind of landed on this because I was looking at, I'll, I'll tell you what I was looking at. I was, uh, I was, obsessing about this presentation and I, I looked and I saw my lucky ball. This is my lucky ball. I don't really hold this ball a whole lot. It's not that kind of weird luck. It's, it's my lucky ball because I caught it at a Washington Nationals game. And, and I always wanted to catch a ball at a Nationals game. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you about this ball because this ball inspired the conversation that we're going to have tonight. And it's about luck. Just who's got it? What's, what's the research out there on luck? Because I, I, I'm normally, I'm a guy who writes books on sales. I talk to groups about selling and persuasion and influence. And I'll drip that into this presentation a little bit. But you are, I've been watching this group for about a year and a half now, I think. At least over a year. And I didn't want to talk about my books I want to talk about you. I want to talk about you, how you got in this room, and what the power of luck, how that plays out. So I'm looking at those questionnaires. If you would, 
Go ahead, we're going to call that your profile, and you're going to see a series of questions. Take a moment. I want you to go land anywhere between 1 and 7. You'll see the scale at the very top, and we're going to kind of figure out your love profile right now as we go into this. And I'm going to tell you more about this ball. So take a moment and go ahead and answer those questions. And when you get them all answered, I want you to total that number at the bottom if you would. One more rule while Rob speaks. Nobody walks out. I'm watching the answers. I'm not funny enough. You can just put your hand up and say, hey, hey, bald guy, let's get it rolling there. Nobody walks out on a jawless presentation. Now let's go back to having fun, shall we? I just want to get that a come because you'll see I get ornery if I see those doors moving. So that's kind of crummy. And if I tell people, if you are, back out like you're so interested you wouldn't even turn your back on me. That don't tell me you just hit the restroom you're going to be back in a second. Okay, should have that about done now. I'm stalling for those of you who take a little more time on your luck. Uh, but let me tell you what your numbers tell you, okay? Just real fast, okay? As you totaled it up, just so you know, if you had a score of 54 or higher, okay? <laughs> You don't have to tell everyone, but that's, that's very good. You have what we call a strong luck profile, and I'll get to that in a moment. If you came in anywhere between 36 and 53, again, you don't have to place your hands. Very good. Okay, but you don't have to put your hands up. We don't want to make the unluckies feel unluckier, but uh, that's good. You did well. You're right in there, and obviously the closer you are to 54, the better, but um, nice job there. If your total came in anywhere between 30, 27 to 35, you're kind of falling into that fair range. Don't worry because the, one of the reasons why I don't want you to hit the exits is I'm not just going to tell you about it. I think we can do concrete things to increase our luck and it's factual, not opinion. So before you walk out of here, we might be able to pick those numbers up a little bit. If you came in at 26, you're lover, please don't put up your hand. Okay, you did. I'm sorry to hear that. That guy definitely doesn't leave the room. Okay, so... <laughs> Increasing your luck. That's what, what, what I started looking at was I was thinking, I called it spheres of luck, okay? And I started thinking about this ball that I caught. And, I, you know, and, and, and this is what I worked out in my head. In a sense, the odds of me catching this ball were 27,781 to 1. That's how many people were in that stadium that day. Now, as far as I'm concerned, a beetle on the floor has a better chance of getting a job at a bug circus, okay, than what we got on catching a ball at 27,781. And then I started thinking about it, and I said, is that really the odds? Because let me tell you a little bit about how that ball came to me. I went to a Nats game two years earlier, and uh, I'm not a big drinker, and when I drink, I'll have a beer. But it was hot, very hot. And I had a beer, and then I thought, you know, I'm going to have another. It's the second inning, what the hey. And I had my second beer, which is very rare for me. So when Rob Jollis has two beers, that's like four for most people. So I was in what we would call happy land. I was just sort of smiling. And a lazy, simple, just a child could have caught it, foul ball came my way, and I washed it, and I washed it, and I'm left-handed, so I put up my mid-hand, which had my beer in it, and it went plip, right over the top of the bottle, and the guy behind me caught it. And I went, ah, oh, I'll never have a chance like that again. So in a sense, the wheels began to turn, because for two years I obsessed on it. 
And then I was at another game. Well, you'll see that there are certain elements of luck, such as preparation, okay? There are certain elements of maybe learning from our mistakes. I'm wondering if it was really 27,781 the second time I was at that stadium. See, people are not born lucky. That is a fallacy. That is not true, okay? The fact of the matter is there are a few basic principles and there's research on this. I started up kind of studying luck for, for a while. I didn't know how I was going to put it together until this weekend. But I, but I started thinking, I want to walk in here and not just tell you, good luck. See, you're doing some things. You're working on your resume. That increases your chances of luck, doesn't it? You're working on your LinkedIn profile. It increases your chances of luck. But see, I'm going to go over nine different elements, that, and I've got a handout at the end that'll have all nine of them on there. For instance, what about practice? Mm -hmm. See, you think that was lucky. I guess it was. I have to tell you, it, I, I got a nice ovation when I caught my ball because I, I didn't pull it off, of, roll it off the floor. Believe it or not, I was sitting, um, not exactly behind home plate, but off to the side. My foul ball went... 200, about 100 miles an hour over my head and rising. Nobody turned around but me because I actually caught it off the facing of where the announcers are on the fly back to me. That's how I caught my foul ball. <laughs> and I'm finished. I, okay. Okay. But, but guess what? Just coincidentally, just coincidentally, I'm the youngest of four. My, uh, my one brother, who's close in age, really wasn't a baseball player. It's just a coincidence, but from third grade to seventh grade, I developed a game at home where I threw the ball off the wall to me over and over and over again. And I was a Washington Senators fan, and Frank Howard was, throwing, was coming off the wall, and Mike Epstein was coming off the wall, and Ed Stroud was coming off the wall, and Eddie Brinkman was coming off the wall, and really Rodriguez was coming. I knew them all. I even knew who was pitching that day. I would, I would get in trouble occasionally at school, but I was always thinking I got a game tonight that I'm playing. And I would play a nine-inning game, me usually against the Orioles. We would coincidentally almost always win. And uh, <laughs> it didn't happen in real life. And, uh, but in a sense, what if I told you 27,781, but what if a guy spent four years and threw 10,000 balls off the wall? Wouldn't that actually increase the chances of success of catching a ball off a wall, if you think about it? So maybe it wasn't quite 27,000. See, I think that when we practice, and I'm wondering how much actively we're practicing, I guess I'm asking you, in a sense, how much time are you putting in to truly practicing for these opportunities? And I mean serious practice. Role play with me. Let me play this out. Sometimes sitting there in the car or by yourself is not really practice. I think, I'm wondering if we do that, would our chances of success increase? And every time I say that, would you do me a favor and just go, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of like, but, but with the, that energy a little bit. So I'm going to ask you again because we're going to do it nine times. If we practice, I mean really practice hard, discipline, would our chances of success increase? Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, then let's go to number two because what about preparation? When I came into the stadium that day, I actually looked at my aisle, and there were a few seats open, and I actually, a friend of mine was with me, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm marking my territory. And I looked it up, and I said, I, I tapped the guy in front of me, and I said, I got from here to here. This is my area. And he said, okay, I got, all right, weirdo, but you see, you got that area. So I mapped out my area. In a sense, what I was doing was, I was prepared. I was not going to be sitting there with a lazy, silly grin and a beer bottle in my hand. This time I was going to be prepared. So now I've practiced. In a sense, I've also prepared for this moment. And it wasn't a joke with me. I actually thought, if it comes to me, that's what's going to happen. How much thought do you put into your preparation? Think about it. How many of you watch the show The Office from time to time? I think it kind of jumped the shark, but boy, back in the day, it was a great show. I love this little clip that I'd like to show you that deals with a very interesting type of preparation. So when I say prepare, watch this, okay? Watch our sound, too. Oh. 
why are we trying to get here? This is a beauty salon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big order. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Hey, how's he doing? Oh, she's great. This is us last year in Bermuda. <laughs> Lovely place. You ever been to Bermuda? Interesting. 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 So, once again, I kind of look at that and I say to myself, huh, huh, huh. Wouldn't our chances for success increase if we intelligently prepare? Okay, and practice. Now we got two. What's the answer to that question? Yeah. yeah. yeah of course. Okay. So, so all of a sudden, twenty-seven thousand seven hundred eighty-one to one. I, I really don't think so. Okay. How about learning from our mistakes? A huge one. And I'm going to get personal a little bit. And, and I, I put this in, and I took it out, and I put it in, and I took it out because there was a part of me that didn't want to irritate you tonight. And then there was another part that said, ah, irritate him, he'll be all right. <laughs> it's not at the end of the world. But I have to tell you that I'm talking about a couple things that are a little sensitive right now. I'm talking about, when I say learning from your mistakes, I'm talking about, in a sense, revisiting why we're here. Mm, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, are you holding on to it? Are you holding on to it? Because if you didn't have some, you would be a robot. How long are you going to hold on to it? Because it's going to get in your way. You know that. Right? So we all have that story. And I'm going to go over a couple of mine so you're not alone. We're all here together. We're here because some things were right and some things weren't right. There were some injustices done, perhaps. I understand. Got it. How long are you going to hold on to that anger? Because if I'll tell you right now, if holding on to it increased your chances of success, I'd say hold on, hold on, hold on to that rope. Don't let go of that anger. We're going to use it. But we can't use it. It gets in the way. It's not going to help us. It's going to trickle out somehow, some way. And that's not what I'm bringing to an interview. Matter of fact, I'm going to let go of that anger. It's not easy. Sometimes it doesn't take a day or three days, but you know when it's gone. You'll know when it's gone when somebody mentions that name or that moment or that person or that place, and you don't feel it anymore. Now we're ready to roll up our sleeves and get to work, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But let's not ignore it. It's normal, it's expected, and yet we got to deal with it. We, we, we got to deal with it. So have you determined what you would have done differently. Now, I've already met a few people, and I've been hanging around for about a year and a half. I've heard many of the stories. I can tell the fresh wounds, because you can't let go of that anger. You're sitting down, and the first thing is, they, they did, they, I got it. I'll tell you what, for anybody who has children, okay, sometimes the easiest way to work this thing out is get out of your own head, pretend your child was in front of you and said, here's the story. You would see things much clearer, wouldn't you? Yeah, it, things get much clearer. What with, with my kids, what, one of my favorite things was when it was the teacher or the, the, the principal or the kid next to him or the guidance counselor, it was, you know, whatever it was, I'd, I'd listen dutifully and I'd say, you know what, just for the sake of this, because we, we've got to get moving here, I'm going to make you magically 90% right. Not, that's a big number. I've never seen an election that went 90% in this country, okay? Not, other countries, yes, so they, they do get into the high 90s somehow, but we, that's not why we're here, okay? But the fact of the matter is, you're now 90% right if that helps you to find clarity. Give me the 10%, because you, I can't stamp your passport and move you on until you tell me what you would have done differently. And if you're locked into, it was them. There was nothing on me. All on them. Can't stamp your passport. You're going to drag it around like a ball and chain. And, it's, and, and people will see it when you walk into a room. They'll, they'll, they'll smell it and they'll feel it. Okay? So how are you going to get rid of that? And the best way I know is to look inside and say, if I was given the chance to do this again, this is what I do differently. This is what I learned from that experience. If you can do that, we get to stamp that passport and move on. 
because it's not increasing our chances of success to hold on to that. And yet, everyone has a story. I get it. Get it told, get it said, and then, as my dad used to say, get it behind you. We can't get it behind us, though, until we learn from it. You know, one of the saddest things you'll ever see, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, is what I refer to as a professional victim. You have friends like that. You know people like that. It was the plumber. It was the electrician. It was the guidance counselor. It was the PTA. It was the community. It was the CVS counter. I don't, whoever. Everything seems to be somebody else, and yet there's never responsibility taken by them. You're 90% right. I'm giving you the, the green light on that. Just tell me the 10%. Because if you can learn from it, guess what? You're not going to repeat that error again. And you get to evolve. You get to move on. For many of you, think about it. Some of the greatest lessons you have in your life are from the mistakes that you made and the lessons you learn from the mistakes that you made. It's not doesn't count just to make mistakes, unfortunately. We all do that. Articulate the lesson, and you get wiser. You become the wise person in the TP. No, no. We've got to learn from our mistakes. And, and to do that, and I'm just going to give you a suggestion. It, it it's, doesn't fit for everyone. And again, i got a list of kind of my nine you know, I wills. It's a pledge I want from you. Your good luck pledge when we're done. But methodically observant. I, I've got something else in my bag there. You know, I started um, keeping a journal. Some would call it a diary, but... I'm a man. <laughs> I call it a journal. A diary just doesn't fit me right. But a journal. And, and I'll tell you how I didn't understand my journal at first. I would write, because uh, I speak around the country, and I would write before I left and when I came back. And the game plan was, I'm going to have something to look back on if I'm blessed when I sit in a rocking chair and review this weird career, and I'm going to have something to give my children so they can read what wacky world their dad was in when he was, you know, in his wheelhouse of his career. And, and what each one of us wouldn't give to have that kind of documentation from, our, from, a, from a parent. And that's why I created it. And here's the mistake I made. I would proudly say, I write them, and I will not look at it because I don't want to edit history. It was actually a pretty good scam if you think about it. The problem is, how was I going to get any wiser? I'm, I'm capturing it, but I'm not really learning anything from it. But what if we became more methodically observant? I'm just throwing it out as an idea. Because what if you, each one of you tonight said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to try this thing. I'm going to throw a date and a time on a document and maybe once a week, it, I, I do it before every trip and after, but I'm going to find a regular time to sit down and put my hands on the keyboard. And sometimes I'm going to write one sentence and the sentence is, I don't have anything to say. Okay? And sometimes I'm going to write, I don't have anything to say, and a page and a half later you're going to be surprised at what you wrote when you just freeformed it and just let it go. Let it go. And then you're going to revisit it. Because when you revisit, revisit it, that's how you learn. You know, I, I kept the journal. And the journal grew. It was 50 pages. It was 100 pages. It was 150 pages. It was five years. It was 10 years. At 16 years, it was almost 2,000 pages. <laughs> okay. But what I did was I actually trimmed it down and realized if I could articulate the lessons, this could be a book. And it was actually one of the books that I wrote. I, 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 and uh, what do you think of this book? Is that a kind of a cool idea? He winked. He's giving me a thumbs up, but then I got the wink, so I just have to figure out how, who to give it to. See, always wink at Rob. It's a very good thing. Okay, so, but weird as it is, I didn't know it was going to be a book. I just thought it was something, but it came to life when I stepped back and I said, great story, but what did I learn about the story? Because I'll tell you right now, there's only one quote of mine in there, and it's Rob Jollis' definition of wisdom came to me on a red eye from L.A. back to D.C. Anybody been on a red eye in here? You know why they call them red eyes, okay? I was somewhere between sleep and wake <laughs> over Topeka. I have no idea where I was. And all of a sudden I went, Pling. I know the definition of wisdom. Wisdom consists of three things. It consists of success, it consists of failure, and it consists of the conscious knowledge of the lessons learned from each. Uh -huh. Now, imagine if we all in here say, I'm going to give this journal thing a kick. 
and I'm going to freeform my thoughts, and there, some of them will be brutal sometimes. And then I'm going to revisit it on a regular basis, and I'm going to try and figure out what I learned from what I just wrote, as opposed to just writing. And if you do, I think you're going to get wiser. I think you're going to learn from your mistakes, and I don't think you're going to make them again. And oh my goodness, think about it for a moment. If we, no matter what the last, if we learn what the, last, what the moral of the story was, and keep accumulating that, ooh, we are going to evolve. We're going to continue to get strong. So I find myself here and now kind of thinking, would your chances of success improve if you actually went through some of the steps of preparation and learning from your mistakes that I just talked about? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. So it, that's so the, 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 I think it's spheres of luck. I still don't, I, I like an evening with Rob Jollis, but I'm sphering it up here. Okay. Because what I'm showing is all of a sudden I did 27,781 to one. Uh uh. It really wasn't the odds that day. We can learn. We can, we can change our success. Here's an interesting one. Now I'm reading. Now I'm going to leave Nationals Ballpark. And now I got inspired. I said, I'm going to pick up some books. I'm going to see what kind of data is out there. Because I'm not going to stand on this stage and say, go get lucky. Get lucky. If you think lucky, if you make lucky, you can be lucky. Right. I, it's not that, OK? It's what, I don't, I, what actionable steps can take. This is an interesting one. Not an opinion, a fact. When I say talking to others, what the data is showing is this, that when you talk to others, when you, your impact of luck increases. What I like that the guys are doing, for instance, over there with LinkedIn is that is an electronic way of increasing the amount of people you know. You see, you think about it. <laughs> How many times do we hear somebody say, it was the weirdest thing. I was in the Safeway line, and I'm talking to this guy, and he knew someone that she knew, and that's how I got my job. And we go, lucky. Well, there was, oh, I'm sorry, if you haven't noticed, I'm starting to track some of the questions you just answered. How many of us really do in that CVS line, in that Safeway line, on that airplane, turn and talk to the person next to us, okay? Sometimes I really don't want to, but think about it. Again, it's not my opinion. It happens to be a fact. When you look at it, lucky people, this is, not, this is what research is showing, consistently encounter chance opportunities. Lucky people, see, they'll, they'll accidentally meet people that will become beneficial. If I don't talk to the person in line, if I don't come to this meeting and get out of my comfort zone and go shake the hand of somebody I don't know and meet them, I lose an opportunity to increase that sphere of people, okay? The electronically, they got it covered across the hallway, but that's not good enough. We can physically do that. And data shows that that increases our chances of being lucky, increases that lucky sphere. So when you think about it, okay, uh, if we do that and increase our network, we increase our chances of being lucky. So you know, my question, are you actively meeting people? Here you are, but I mean getting yourself out there. You know, for me, I was a speaker that was booked 16 years in a row for about four months in advance. Life was good. Then 2009 came up, they took away all those training budgets, and I had to scramble like everyone else. And Rob Jollis, who was famous for blowing into town, Klein would always say, would you like to have dinner with us? I, I, I'd love to, can't make it. My nose would grow nine inches. Boy, do I not want to have dinner with you. I don't know you. I do. want to watch ESPN and get some room service. And, Rest up for the morning, okay? Because that's the life of a speaker. Well, guess what? When we hustle for business, when we're looking for opportunities, I now go to dinner with these clients, okay? And I'm funny. I'm funny, man. I, I work hard at these dinners. I, I am fitting in socially. Funny thing is, I'm, I'm a very extroverted person, but I'm not really, I'd rather talk to 500 people I don't know than four around a table who go, he's funny, be, be funny. 
All righty. <laughs> the organ grinder's monkey. Okay. So, uh, but are you actively meeting people? Think about it. And when I say that, are you staying in contact with these network of people? Electronically, we're doing it. But how else are we doing it? We got to get back to those meetings, go back to the Rotary Club, get back to those memberships that you have and stay active and stay in the hunt. Increase that sphere of people. And finally, as you know, more people you meet and keep in contact with, greater your chances of connecting. These people that have those stories of, I met somebody, it turns out it was my roommate's cousin. Okay, not as lucky as you think. They've increased their sphere and that's what's bringing them that what we call luck. So we can do that. We're capable of doing that. And if we do that, think about it. Would our chances of success increase if we get out of our comfort zone and get out there and meet everything that moves, basically? <laughs> All right, yes or no? Would it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it would. Okay, so how about this one? And I did a little test tonight. You're a good group. I wouldn't call you an overly smiley group. Okay. Well, guess what the research is showing? Lucky people tend to smile. Okay. And you know what happens when you smile? Usually people smile back. Usually. Okay. Um, you know, I, I wrote, I actually wrote an article about this once. I was walking, you ever notice sometimes if you're at a health club or whatever, there's certain people you walk by, you can walk by them for five years. It's the oddest thing. It's like, okay, here's that guy who never looks at me. Well, he ain't getting a look from me. How you doing? As usual, I am not alive. Okay, now how do you like things? It's, it's almost like a bitter thing. And I know that guy is just is just hating me for some reason. Well, I hate you back. It's just this whole thing that's going on, but no one's actually ever spoken. And it goes on for years, and all of a sudden, when you're not paying attention when they go, how you doing? And the person gives you the warmest smile in the world, you realize, I didn't know. I thought that guy was a monster. Not a monster at all. He just wanted you to smile at him, I guess. And oh, by the way, all of a sudden, there's a contact. You know, I had a cousin who did this. And we begin, I never meet that person if I keep walking around like, you don't smile at me, I'm not smiling at you. Where is it written? Like that. And oh, by the way, as long as we're in this room and we're going out there to fight that fight, I say we smile more. Okay? <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is, when you smile, people tend to smile back. Okay? So, that picture. Uh, all I was going to say was this avoid the instinct to look away. I know it's an instinct, particularly here for some reason. People come in and they're like, oh, you know, I, please don't look too hard. I'm here for a reason. Okay. Okay. Guess what? We're all here for a reason. Even the ones with the nice name tags, we're here for a reason, too. Okay, so uh, avoid the instinct to look away. You don't need to look away. Will you do me a favor? As long as you see me coming in here, I really would appreciate it if you smiled at me, because I guarantee if you smile at me, I'm not going to go, how dare you? I want to smile back. It's nice. It works. It increases our sphere. Uh, lucky people, fact, not opinion, smile twice as much as unlucky people. That's what the data is showing. And engage in three times as much open body language. Open body language. Open. Not closed. Open. Not my opinion. Happens to be a fact. So uh, my only thing is, I would strongly suggest you, you practice the smile a little bit because you could scare people. Let's you know. I'm not talking about goofy smiles. You know, work on your smile, you go to the mirror until you get it right, and then feel comfortable with your smile. Smile and the world smiles back, as they say. So smile, it's, you know, and, and here I am again. I'm landing on another point once again. Wouldn't that improve your chances of success if you just smiled at people that you don't know? Yes. It would. So let's get at it. See, again, I'm, I'm on the resume. I'm on all the things that we're doing in here. It's all going to help us, as will our faith. My goodness, we know that. But we, we, we got to help it out a little bit. we got to do our part. So, yeah, we get, look, the bubbles are increasing. How about this one? And I got some of my tune mates in here, as I call them. Yeah, some of my see. people that, there they are, they're hey. in different places. Some people spent two days with me. And we worked hard on this. It wasn't easy. 
But when I say believing, I mean really believing. You know, you don't know this, but sometimes I come up and I shake your hand and I'll meet you and I'll be introduced. And I am watching much harder than you think. And you know what I'm asking myself? Do, do I believe you? Not that you're telling me, not that you're not telling me the truth, but I guess I'm sort of saying, do you believe you? Is what I'm looking at. When you walk up and say, um, you know, I love what JV does. JV works on these amazing elevator spe speeches and pitches. But you know what JV does that because you've heard him speak? It's not just the words of JV. It's the tune of JV. Okay? We, sometimes we work on the words, but we don't work on the tune. Okay? Try, me, try this exercise just for a second. I'm going to give you a, a minute and a half, okay? And what I want you to do is just pair up twos, threes, doesn't matter to me. It's going to be a 60-second exercise. And what I'd like one of you to do is look at the other and say, why do you think you'd be right for this job? And all I want the other person to do is answer the question in 30 seconds or less, okay? Try it. Everybody clear? Kind of look around. Who's going to be your partner, okay? And just do that exercise right now. Why do you think you'd be right for this job? Go ahead, and turn, and make it happen. Let's go. spontaneously, not only believe in themselves, they'll look at their bad luck and imagine how things could be worse. That's a fact. I got that out of one book. I've got a number of books I was reading through. I was in a book called The Luck Factor. They said factually that that's what people do. They constantly sort of turn over their situation and they think how things could be worse. So in a sense, while they're experiencing bad luck, they feel like they're experiencing good luck. How obnoxious. <laughs> But it seems to work. So, uh, you know, I, I had this corny little, you know, it's, it's an evening with Rob, so you're stuck with me. But I want to tell you, I've been on this for a while, this theory. I believe that everything that happens in front of us was like a windshield. You can look at it one of two different ways. Everything. You can look at it one of two ways. And when we're getting beaten up and we're a little discouraged, we seem to be leaning everything towards that negative. Even if somebody hands us a $100 bill, why couldn't it have been 200 It just, <laughs> it just seems to keep going that other way. I, I really do believe that everything in front of you has two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we're talking about increasing our chances of luck. 
if I thought obsessing on the negative would increase my chances, I'd be competitive obsessing negatively. But it doesn't work that way. Which do you see? Okay? Think about it for a second. What exactly is stopping us from seeing things from the other side? My goodness, most of you in here, you know what's going to happen. You know that you will find that next job. And you know once you do, because it's happened maybe before where you've made changes, what do you always say once you're comfortable in another one? Boy, I should have left earlier. <laughs> right? We all say it. I should have gotten out of that situation earlier. It was toxic. It wasn't working. It was for them or for me. We all say that while we're in the middle of kind of getting punched around a little bit, it's hard to see that message. But that's the reality of the message. Think about it. So, let's do this. This is an exercise I used to do with my kids, and we're going to do it in here. I used to walk in with the Washington Post, and I used to say, let's look at some of these headlines. And there aren't a whole lot of happy headlines in the Washington Post. So, what I want you to do, it's an exercise, okay, is I want you to look at that, but these are the last two days. I looked at these and I went, ha, ah, there's good news. GM is recalling another 7.6 million vehicles. Okay, going back to 1997 now. That sounds pretty rotten. Or is it? How would you, I mean, wait, but let's not even do this as a small group. Just, just shout it out. Somebody tell me, read that for me and tell me something positive about that. Is that, is that all? <laughs> like that. Very good. Right there. That's an opportunity for 7.6 million vehicle owners to go back to their GM dealership. It's yeah. an opportunity for 7.6 to get to go back to that GM dealership. Absolutely. And thinking like a salesman. Uh, not that we would ever want that to happen at GM. But, yeah, got a lot of prospects coming in. All we got to do is, is move that objection to the side a little bit. I saw a hand going up over there. Yes, sir. Potentially save lives. Yeah. Well, about time we had a company we could probably trust now that they're been, they've been forced to look at the customer. Right, okay. Now yeah. Now. It's sort of like I always look at it like when you spill a drink. I was talking to, to somebody about this tonight. And, you know, I've had so many dinners with clients. I, you know, in 30 years, I did knock one over once. But it was almost like the world according to Garp for me. Uh. If you've ever seen that, I felt like, well, now I'm safe from knocking water over at a business meeting for at least 10 more years. Because it's not if, but when it's going to happen. The fact is, yeah, uh, look, it, it's, it's bringing focus to that. It's going to save lives. I don't see that as a negative article. Uh, how about this one? Uh, Harper's marketability, this is right in the sports page today, and clubhouse mentality are difficult to balance. <laughs> that guy. Or can we look at it a different way? Think about it. Tell me something positive about that. He has marketability for a franchise that desperately wants to market itself. And oh, by the way, he came back last night. Coincidentally, I think they had about 6,000 more people in the seats to see Colorado play. Yeah. Hmm. What do you know? So positive. Give me another one. Back there. Yeah, he's young and he's figuring things out. It's, it's a growing organization, a growing person. He's 21. Okay. Yeah. He's 21. It's a, he's going to figure things out just like you did, just like I did. I didn't, we don't have to be depressed by that article. What else? He's hard charging. All he wants to do is dust. He, yeah, what a crime. You mean he just wants to win and be hard charging and do his best. You know, it comes with the package sometimes. I... I don't know about you, but I kind of like his irritability. You know, I, I, you know it, 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 I wish more people would be a little more, more irritable sometimes. I, I'm a Washington Caps fan, too, and I know they're trying, but I don't get a sense there's a lot of irritability on the ice out there. You know, I, I don't know. I, I haven't gone in a while, but I have a family of five. If I took them to a Caps game, it would probably cost me about $1,000 now. I'm not making that number up. And how many times we read and said they weren't ready to play? You know, they, they get, if I paid a thousand dollars, I said, "Hey, you know, we're just, uh, you know, we didn't have it tonight. We, we weren't ready to play, but where do you see us tomorrow? Well, I, somebody returned a thousand dollars. Could you be ready to play? Come on. But I like that. I, we can look at it in a different way. It's just why? How? Why would that be productive? I don't think this is irresponsible. My, one of my publishers is Barrett Kohler. We have a retreat coming up, and I get to, I'm interviewing an author that just wrote a book called, uh, okay, I've got half the word, I just want to get it right for you. Um, I'll make up a thing, this is what we speakers do, soon I'll just make something up and move on. Oh uh, yeah, it's, 
It's Intelligent Optimism. Okay. That's the name of the book. Do I need to tell you more? No. I already like it. Because optimism's great. But I want intelligent optimism, which means uh, I know, you know, I, I do believe that there are more stories to tell on the news that are intelligent and optimistic. We know they don't sell commercial space rule. I get it. But this guy's created a website, etc. It's, it's not irresponsible uh, optimism. It's intelligent optimism. Why can't we have intelligent optimism? Which, is there something wrong with that? If you think about it. So that's intelligent optimism, really. North Korea putting two Americans on trial for hostile acts. Oh, that's so sad. It is. But then again, what's that? They're not, They're not killing them. I like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> See, it can always be worse. <laughs> you know how many people go missing in some of these countries that are a little more challenged, so to speak? At least we know where they are and the world is watching. I don't think it's as negative as you would say, but that I'm not manufacturing that. That's where my mind would go. Because if I keep going to the other side of that windshield for everything, I'll be walking around like this. I don't need to. Uh, I don't need to. Uh, the fact is, yeah, I do believe, you know, that, that we have to believe in ourselves. We have to be able to convince others. Think about it. Now, I'm going to give you another clip I want you to see. How many of you have seen the show Shark Tank? There you go. Great show. If you haven't seen it, I think it's required viewing. I really would if you get it on your DVR because you're going to learn about how to present ideas a little bit. And you know, they've got five sometimes cranky and obnoxious millionaire billionaires who bully every now and then. Let's leave that alone. But what we have in the real world is a group of people that are saying, convince me. Guess what we do? And I do it all the time. I'm a consultant. I am convincing people six days a week. I got the same thing. They're on the phone. They're in front of me going, convince me. Convince me. Or we're not going to buy your product. So what, that, I happen to like, I think her name is Lori. I happen to like Lori a lot because unlike some of the other millionaires slash billionaires, this is a woman who is in QVC and in the pit fighting seven days a week. I really value what she has to say. She had an interesting conversation about a couple of years ago with this woman who was selling a pretzel that she was working on. I'm going to show you part of the conversation. I want you to watch this very interesting answer she gives to convince me. Watch. My name is Raven Thomas and my company is The Painted Pretzel. I'm seeking $100,000 in exchange for 25% of equity. What makes The Painted Pretzel so amazing is that our pretzels come in unlimited flavor combinations. We coat our pretzels in many types of chocolates, from white, dark, milk, to butterscotch, peanut butter, and mint, and then top them with unique toppings like candy bars, nuts, and even fruit. Oh, wow. Mm. <laughs> hey, fantastic. Mm. I'm here because I would really like a strategic partner, and I need the investment. We've had a great start, but it's nowhere near its full potential. And I can really use your help. If you had to say to us right now, why we should invest in this, give us your very best. Why should we invest in you? The main reason is because I have two little kids and I'm showing them that you just follow your dreams. You can do whatever you decide to do with your life. I'm doing it, I'm successful, and I'm gonna keep going. It makes me happy, it's fun. It's, you know, something that I really love to do. Okay. Yeah, beautiful. That's just a beautiful response. It's, 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 it's so heartfelt and so sincere. It's lovely. There's only one thing wrong with just one thing. It's wrong. It's the wrong response. I'm going to, this, I'm going to tell you why I like watching this show. Because it's honest. I want you to see what comes next. That's not enough for me. Yeah, you know what, Raven? It's a good story, but it's not a good reason. Okay. This is the real world of business. Right. When someone like that asks you that question, you got to give her a benefit as an investor. So let's do that again. Okay, let's Don't do Don't tell that. me about your family. Well, before, before you do that again, I'm out. Give us one reason that we should invest in it. One reason is that, and maybe you would change your mind when I say this. Ain't going to happen. Okay. 
Well, I had to walk away from a $2 million deal because I did not have the capital to fill the order. Hello. That's a good reason. <laughs> Shut the front door. <laughs> good for you. Who, who was it from? Sam's Club. You got an order from Sam's Club? You yes. Had to $2 million. I had to walk away from that. Because How long ago was that? I just spoke to them last week, and the door is wide open. I can fill the same order within the next two Okay, Raven, months. I'm going to sell you now, right? Do you have an interest in being my partner? I do. Okay. I'm here. You well, I'm going to make it very, very simple for you. I own the Mavericks, right? Yes. We can sell those in our arena. Absolutely. Did you know that I own Landmark Theaters? Absolutely. We can sell those all across Landmark Theaters. Woo. I'm prepared to give you $100,000 for 25% if you're ready to say yes right now. You better say yes right now. Yeah, you say I'm ready to say yes right now. Wow. She was looking for. And by the way, you didn't see, she was asking for $100,000 for 25%. If you've watched the show, it's a rarity to see them give what the person's asking for and not negotiate. I really like Mr. Wonderful in the middle who said it ain't gonna happen. Eat his words. Yeah, well, it ain't going to happen with you, but she's got a $2 million order you might be interested in. Uh, the fact of the matter is, she then answered the question. Guess what's going on every time you have an interaction professionally with someone who owns a company who's looking at your piece of paper? What they're saying is, convince me. Okay? And I need, and what they're really saying is, what's in it for us? Mm -hmm. okay, that's how you're going to convince me. You know, Gordon Gecko from Wall Street years ago was right. Okay, greed is good. Okay, I know that sounds horrible, but you know I was hoping that we wouldn't go running for the doors here because I would have a hundred and some people who really wanted to get something out of this presentation, and in, I'm going to call that greed. And I got a windshield that says that's not bad. That's good. So you're saying this better be good? I'm coming up here going, I hope you want a great message. What's the alternative? I don't care if the guy helps me or not. I don't really care. I just want to eat a bagel. Okay? I'm not the end of the world. We got more. But you're not my kind of audience. I want you to want it. I want you to want it. You want to work for a company that, crazy as it sounds, wants to be successful, wants to be productive, and is trying to figure out how you're going to help them get there. And in a nutshell, it was a lovely story about feeling good and taking care of the kids. But that doesn't answer the question, does it? No. Then she answered it. Why can't we remember that? We can remember that. You know, there's a couple of elephants in the room. So let, let's go process behaviors. One of them is, you're talking to people here. You're, I keep telling you, let's get to some other meetings. But how do you ask them for help? We know we keep telling you, ask them for help. All right. Okay, I don't know how, how do you say it? I would think it out a little bit. So I, I have this one approach that I like when I'm trying to set a meeting with a client. I've never met this person in my life and I'm thinking, how many, how many, how many, I want to get into lunch or a cup of coffee. How about we do this? You know what? Let's get together because I want to understand more about what you do. And while we're there, I'll tell you a little bit more about me and and then at the end of the conversation, you'll either see value in, in what I have to offer or you won't. That, in other words, I'm going to give you a way out of the conversation, which is why half the people say, I really don't do coffee a lot, but send me your resume. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we give them, what if we're saying, hmm, you know what? Here's what we'll do. I, I just want to hear more about you. I'll tell you a little bit more about me. And then we'll see whether you'll either find value or you won't. So I'm even going to give you a get out of jail free card. Uh, that's one way of getting rid of that elephant in the room of what does this coffee sound like? How do you invite somebody to a networking opportunity? It's an approach, okay? A second elephant in the room is asking for help. We keep saying it, go ask for help. Well, tell me the words you use when you ask for help. Help! Okay, well, that's, that's a word, okay, and not bad, but I feel like we could improve upon that. And yet, it's one of the hardest things to do. And so I've got, and I've, I've, if you like it, write this down, okay? Because I have something that I happen to love to do with people, not when I shake their hands this way, but when we're done. And I feel like there's something there. See, I know they're looking at me going, I'll help the guy. 
guess, okay? Here's what I love to say. Just a few words. If you were me, what recommendations would you make? Now, a lot of times I'm talking to the guy at IBM, okay, who I got networked through to here, and I learned more about him, and he learned more about me, and everybody is we're singing kumbaya, and everything's good. And, you know, I really think, and what happens when I say, you know what, if you were me, what, would, what steps would you take to try and make this opportunity work? And you know what happens? Now you're speaking their language. People go, you know, I'll tell you what, I know a guy who, and all of a sudden things start rolling, because now, in a sense, you're, in, you're enlisting their help. But leave that sentence out, and you'll see that there's sort of two ships passing in the night. If you were me, what would you do? I would absolutely go to personnel. I do this. You know what? I know the guy. Let me have. It never ends. Usually, it never ends with. I would just go do that. It almost always ends with. I would do that, and I actually know a person. Why don't you do this? And then what I'll do is, and now we have an ally. In with one simple sentence. Try it. You'll like it. And when I see you in the meeting next time, smiling at me, you'll tell me. You know what? It works. It works. It's a great opportunity. So, we've been on this one for a while, but what do you think? Would that improve your chances of success if you actually not only believed in yourself, and, and but were able to convince others as well? Would that help? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In my kind of group. Okay. This is one I really like. And I sort of stumbled on this with my toolmates, as I call them, because I started thinking, think like an actor. Seriously? You know, I, I had never performed in my life until I was a junior in high school. Uh, I, was, uh, I used to run track and play basketball. That was my thing. And I finally got pulled into this play by one of the directors. We did, of all plays, Damn Yankees, okay? And I got recruited to try out by this director, and somehow, I think he liked the visual because I was five foot nothing and a hundred and nothing in 11th grade, and he's made me the manager of the team, okay? I was to play an old man, and half the team were basketball players at Churchill High School, so I was up to their navel, and, you know, and I was lost. I didn't know about acting. I just, how am I supposed to play an old man? I'm, I'm in 11th grade. I look like I'm four. You know? This just can't work. And that director used to pass by me, and he'd go, Jobs, the, the character's name was Benny Van Buren. What does Benny eat for breakfast? And he'd keep walking, and I'd go, what? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know Walked by me the next day, you know. What kind of car does he drive? A, a Chevy, you knucklehead. You know, uh, I, you know what? Well, tell me about the house he lives in. Start slowly. Well, I think he lives in an older Cape Cod home. Yeah? Tell me about his, what kind of pets he has. He's got an old dog. It's, 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 a, it's a hunting dog. Tell me about the, the clothes he wears. Well, He's got his pants hiked up just a little too high. <laughs> Showing some sock. I, off what he was doing was, he was getting me to think like Benny Van Buren. See, I could learn the words from the script, but I didn't know the tune. Now, the words were easy because I was Benny Van Buren. Why can't we think like actors? I'm not asking you to be something you're not. I'm saying, what character are you playing? I know my character. I know that before I walked up here, giving a presentation I've actually never delivered in my life, I knew I walked up here and I said, you, I kind of you know, was chanting in my head, and it wasn't, you're going to fail. Now go get them. <laughs> it was quite a pep talk. It was really good. But no, oh, I, you know what? Get up there and grab that baseball. Get up there and do what you know. You, you will trust yourself. This is not your first run. I mean, that was the character I was playing. And so it became easier because the words are actually the easy part. The tune is the hard part. Why can't we think like actors? Why can't you think like an actor? In other words, think about it. Let, let's go over just a couple simple acting tips. Be in the moment. Know your character. Who is your character? <laughs> think about it. It, remember that exercise which we're going to revisit? We're going to try it again in a minute. Only this time, before you open your mouth and tell me <laughs> the answer to it, tell us a little about yourself, I actually want you to think of a character. It won't be Betty Van Buren. It's actually going to be you. 
but it's going to be you as a person who is confident, dedicated, who can help this company succeed and believes it with every fiber that within themselves. And I mean believes it, okay? And if you do, I want to hear that character answer the question. You were probably obsessing on the words. Good for you. I want you to obsess on the sound that you're making. That's what they need to hear. That's what moves people. I want you to make eye contact. Don't be afraid of it. We don't need to stare them down. But don't be nervous about looking somebody in the eye. Okay? I want you to focus on the objective and not the outcome. I can't, I actually can't control the outcome, but I can control the objective. And the objective is for them to see who I really am. Because sometimes we walk out and we almost think there's a, if only they knew who I was. Well, get back in there and play that character. Who are you? Okay, what kind of car do you drive? Well, we think about how you, who, the, who they're looking for. I want, to, I want to walk in confidently. See, I do want to try this exercise one more time. Okay, and I want you in a moment to turn right back to the person that you were paired up with. But this time, I want you to take a moment. I don't want you to think about the words at all. They'll be there. I want you to take a moment and quietly ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? And believe it. I'm a person that will help you be successful. I don't want to give you all your, your words because they're your words. But I, I, I can help this company. I'm really good at this job. I deserve it and I'm ready for it. Now answer the question and see what it sounds like. Let's learn the two. I'll give you 60 seconds or so. Do the exercise again, but deliberately take a moment, pause, make good eye contact, and feel the answer. Go. obsessing on and you're in control of the tune <laughs> so guess what that's going to do that's going to increase your confidence on the words one supports the other one you can control the other will be there it'll be there particularly if I can say hey guess what I'm going to remove a significant percentage of your anxiety because we just did okay so I ask him very simply okay do you think like that thinking like an actor 
will improve your chances for success. Yes. 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 Absolutely. 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 Coming down the home stretch, I've only got two more for you. I call this one the great equalizers. Okay? And the great equalizers to me are energy and enthusiasm. That's what people want to see. See, there's a lot of things you can't control. Can't control a lot of things. Mm -hmm. One thing you can always be in control of is your energy and your enthusiasm. How many people ever coach kids in here? Okay, and what do we tell the kids? Can't control the refs, don't really want to worry about the refs. I can actually can't control when the ball goes in the hoop. What we can't control is our energy and our enthusiasm. And if we do that and we work on the things that we've been working on in practice, we'll do pretty well. I, uh, I, I, and I was in a bad mood, but they wouldn't give me my Great Falls coach's shirt unless I attended a clinic put on by Kevin Grevy some years ago. And I had coached 53 teams. I didn't want to go to a clinic, but I wanted my shirt, so I went to my clinic. <laughs> One of the greatest clinics I ever went to, if you've ever had the privilege of listening to Kevin Grevy talk basketball, that's special. And for any real Washingtonians, you know that he played on the last world championship team that we had. So I'm listening to Kevin Grevy. But one thing I loved was a question that was asked. Who was his favorite coach? Answer, Don Nelson. Why? Because in his entire career playing for Don Nelson, Don Nelson never told him, go out and win. The word win never came in there. Execute. Work on the things that we've been working on. That we can control. And if we do that, chances are we're going to be successful. And all of a sudden, again, a confidence comes back because we can control that. I, I, I love this little clip. It's from a commercial that I took that I loved put on by Federal Express a few years ago. You'll probably recognize it. Uh, I want you to look at it and think about the message here and how we can associate with this message. It's a quick one. Watch this commercial. We have got the most people with ideas. We could open an account on FedEx.com to save 10% on express shipping. Okay, how about this? We open an account on FedEx.com and say 10% on Express shipping. That is funny. You just said the same thing I said, only you did this. No, I did this. If you listen to some of the little chatter, it's like, well, it makes all the difference. I mean, they're all, okay. But you know, I look at that commercial and I say, think about it. Think about it. We need to do this. That's what we got to do. The first guy, you know, at first I thought, oh, that's not fair. And then I said, you know, it is fair. If you watch the guy, oh, we can do this, a battle of Christ, okay. That's not the way I'm handling my communications in business. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And that helps people hear, and that helps them believe. That there's a message there. We can control our energy and our enthusiasm. Very important. I have, since I was a, a very young, as I mean, maybe 22, 23, I've always quietly pinned on a little lightning bolt. You probably can't even see it. I've been speaking for 30 years. I still put on my lightning bolt right before I speak. You know why? Because I'm not leaving it up to chance. That the act of doing that to me centers me and reminds me. These people don't care where you've been or what you've done. It's here and it's now. You can't control a lot of this message, but you can control that energy and enthusiasm, and you will. Uh, that is in your control. And you know what? That helps. Think about it for a second. The great equalizers. The great equalizers. How much energy and enthusiasm do you display? Do me a favor. Come back sometime and tell me, guess what, I had an interview. I was too energetic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about that one. Okay? I'll give you a dollar, okay? You know, that's a, that you deserve it. I've never heard of such a thing. I rarely, rarely. As a matter of fact, even when, I'm, I, when I used to, uh, in my 20s, I would direct, I'd direct some shows in Maryland. I always wanted an actor that would give me too much. That's easy to, pick, to pull back on. But I don't know sometimes whether there's more in the tank there. That's the harder one. So I'll always err on a little bit too much. That's fine. We'll pull back a little bit. But it's okay to be enthusiastic. And again, the nice thing is it's 100% in your control. 100% in your control, particularly when you learn the tune. So reminding yourself that 
If I'm energetic and I'm enthusiastic and I can display that, do you think that might increase your chances for success? Yes. 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 Well, then we're down to one last one, okay? And that, to me, is making your weakness your strength. You've got to do it. I was a good basketball player. I used to play with Will and destroy him. But that's neither here nor there right now. Besides, Will doesn't have a microphone. But the important thing is this. I got to be a better basketball player. I'm left-handed. I go very well to my left. And most people are expecting me to go right. So for the first five minutes of the game, I was deadly. Until he went, you know what? That guy seems to like his left hand. Then it's not so hard anymore. I became a basketball player when I taught myself to go to my right. Okay. That's, any tennis players? Okay, yeah, flat serves are great, unless you play somebody who knows how to play tennis. Then you're going to have to learn a kick serve. And you know, you're going to get a little bit worse before you get better. But your plane of improvement is going to increase. Is it a hobby <laughs> or is it a profession? Uh, make your weakness your strength. I'm going to disclose something I've never talked about before in here, but I figure this is a good audience for it. Because uh, I haven't just been a casual observer. You know, when you think about your biggest weakness, I work for Battelle Memorial Institute in Washington, D.C. on 21st Street, 21st and M. I was a good employee, I thought. I was real good. Uh, turns out we were a contract company, and we were doing a training program, and they loved me as a trainer. They loved me, because I was good. But now, there was also some writing elements to the job, but that wasn't my thing. I made sure everyone knew, hey, I'm not your writer. <laughs> I'm your speaker. They said, yeah, you are good at it. We love you. Okay. Well, I taught everyone exactly where my strengths and weaknesses were, and they loved me. Uh, unfortunately, when the contract was up, we didn't have a contract. We were writing our fees, and we needed writers. Okay. So uh, there were seven of us. They only laid one off. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Did I say not writer? I meant fighter. I'm a fighter. <laughs> I, yeah, very hard to take those words back. Yes. Uh, I educated my boss to where my weaknesses were, and oh, by the way, I really wasn't a very good writer. And um, I started this presentation by telling you we got to get rid of the anger, because ooh, I was angry. Those rats, okay? Not only was my first child on the verge of being born, and I'm getting my walking papers, as if that should matter, but unfortunately it doesn't. Uh, I, you know, I, I, well, who's, uh, they didn't hire me to be a writer. It's unfair. Life's unfair. Writing's unfair. 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 And then once I got through the cloud of unfairness, I took a writing class at Montgomery College. And what I'm telling you this story because I'm very proud of the fact that I learned how to write, and then I wrote a book, and then I wrote a second one, and then I wrote a third one, and then I wrote a fourth one, and then I wrote a fifth one, and three of them are bestsellers, and that fourth one's on the way. And I'm not, I don't want you to applaud, I don't want you to do anything. I want you to understand that you're looking at a guy who had been laid off because he couldn't write. Well, he can write now. Okay? What if we lift that cloud again and really look at it and say, I got this Achilles heel. I keep hearing about it. What if I teach myself to go to my right? And for you righties, come to the left, okay? But what if we actually walked that walk and stopped announcing, I do this, but I don't do that? Well, I do that well, too. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it's a, it's a wonderful target to, to obtain. What is your biggest weakness? Could we make that our strength? Think about it. They were right. I should have been laid off from that job. Once I got through the cloud of it all, you know, but baby born, everything, that wasn't the work criteria. Who's got a baby coming? Okay? That really wasn't their issue. That was my issue. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a good writer. I made sure people knew about it. And that's how I lost my job. And they should have laid me off. Now, if you saw me right back then, I wasn't. And now I'm evolving. I'm like, I hate them. I'll kill them. Okay, but, <laughs> but I got over it, and I made it my strength. What are you actively doing? to improve in that area. Think about it. What are you doing? What's, where is that 10%? And are you taking measurable acts to fix it, or are you stuck in that victim mode? We've got to get out of that chair. Do you think that taking that weakness and making it a strength would improve your chances of success? Yes. 27,781 to 1. I'm not buying it. I, 
think my odds were better than that. I think your odds are a heck of a lot better than that. And I'll leave you with one last thought, because I'm a clip guy. I happen to love this clip from Dead Poet Society. Okay? So, for those of you who've been a while have seen that movie, we're going to catch that one final <coughs> thought. And I don't think it needs a whole lot of explanation. Let's take a look, and we'll wrap up. Mr. Pitts. It's a rather unfortunate name. Mr. Pitts. How are you? Mr. Pitts, if you open your hymnal to page 542, read the first stanza of the poem you find there. Do the virgins to make much of time? Yes. The one. Somewhat appropriate, isn't it? Virgins. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Who knows what that means? Seize the day. Carpe diem. That's seize the day. Very good, Mr. Meeks. Meeks. Another unusual name. Seize the day. Gather ye rose, but while ye may. Why does the writer use these lines? Because he's in a hurry. No! Ding! Thanks for playing anyway. <laughs> because we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. I'd like you to step forward over here. Bruised some of the faces from the past. You've walked past them many times. I don't think you've really looked at them. They're not that different from you, are they? Same haircuts, full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. Did they wait until it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. <laughs> if you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. Go on, lean in. Listen. You hear it? so much. What, what an amazing evening with Rob. So you can see why I thought he's presented like a thousand times before, because it's just so memorable. You just don't forget a presentation that, where'd he go? He's, 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 already, he's already running off. Well, there's, there's some follow-up that I actually wanted to say with Rob's stuff, but actually I want to bring a namesake of Rob's up here. Not a relative, but another Rob. Uh, this is, I think, a first time for CNN. I don't know that we've ever had a post-presentation victory lap. And uh, this, is, this is a special one because it turns out that uh, this individual is actually leaving for Florida tomorrow. 
Uh, many of you might recognize his mug because you see him on our LinkedIn group as being one of our advisors and actually helped get us started in doing LinkedIn training here at CNM, if I, my memory serves correctly. So um, while I hate to take away from Rob's spotlight, I just can't pass up the opportunity where we saw Rob Mendez walk in the door. And we have to give him a chance to please give him a round of applause. And he has his journey to share, and this is wonderful to see him here tonight. So thank you for giving his attention. Uh, this is probably the best victory lap I can imagine, having a man come back and do this for us, Rob Mendez. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Well, it's great to be here. I miss all of you so much, and um, I know that it's late, so I just want to give you, um, I guess, the, the how to supercharge your job in five minutes or less, job search. Um, I, I was uh, let go from Chase uh, earlier this year, which actually was a blessing, and so I figured, okay, you know what, not a problem. I'm going to go ahead and do what I've always done and everything I was teaching people, and I started doing it, and I wasn't getting any calls. I'm like, uh-oh, something's changed again. Who moved my cheese? <laughs> so um, I, I went ahead and I redid my resume and redid my LinkedIn profile and, and it's all out there, you guys can look at it. Um, but I wanted to share with you a couple of things that really made a very uh, meaningful impact. So for those of you that are looking for jobs or want to keep your job options open, um, one of the things I suggest you do is you go to the career boards like Monster, Dice, um, uh, Career Builder and type in a few of the different um, job titles that your job could fall under and see how many come back. So if one comes back like a thousand jobs in the area, another comes back 2,000 jobs, use the, that title that has more listings throughout your resume. Then go ahead and upload your resume, the exact same resume, to Monster, Dice, Career Builder, every day. That'll make your resume pop up on their dashboard when they log in and you'll get call after call every day. When I did that the first time, I would get calls for two days and then it would die out. And then I'd make a change on my resume, upload it again, and I'd get calls again for another two days and then it would die out. I'm like, huh, I wonder what happens if I do the same resume over and over again. And the calls would just not stop. Um, and now if you do your resume really well, um, you'll, you'll get put on the fast track, you'll get put on the short list for interviews. Uh, like happened with me, I had to actually tell them, you know, no. Um, so I got more interviews uh, and I got a job right away um, in less than a month and the reason it took a month was because the training manager was in training uh, the people the recruiter and all that it took them a week to like forward it to each other and just you know human stuff but once the hiring manager um, scheduled the interview with me um, one day to the next she scheduled it for the following day she liked what she heard she invited me to the group interview the next day and then she made me the job offer right after that so um, really, it's, it's just something that will help you tremendously. Upload the exact same resume every day to Monster Career Dice, and, uh, and you'll see the calls will just start to come in as well. Don't forget about LinkedIn, because that will work on its own. Um, but really, it's, uh, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, uh, you'll see my, my short one-page gorilla resume on there. And then if you go to resume.robmendez.com, you'll be able to download my long version resume. RobMendez.com now is, is just simply a resume website um, that you can, it's just basically my resume in a web format that I did myself. But there's, um, without doing all that fancy stuff, I just say that so you guys can go there and download it, um, but without doing that fancy stuff, if you just take your resume, upload it every day, that'll give you the biggest bang for your buck. So um, it was great seeing everyone. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and... Oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Citibank in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So uh, I'm, I'm, God's placed heavily on my heart to open up a CNM down there. So uh, we'll see if we can uh, maybe do some video uh, presentations and collaborations. So thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for allowing me to be a blessing in your lives throughout the years. And you know, for those of you that have kept me in your prayers, thank you as well. Oh, what a family we have here. I'll tell you what, you know, this is one of the wonderful things about having people volunteer. Uh, uh, John Foster, who got hooked into the whole LinkedIn stuff, now actually goes around the, the counties doing LinkedIn presentations. Uh, 
Rob Mendez basically got us started on all, a lot of the social media stuff was our, our founder getting that aspect going. So uh, it's just amazing to see when you really start putting yourself out there and you contribute in whatever way you can, uh, how this uh, blossoms and the relationships you build. So uh, I, I will say one quick thing related to uh, Rob Jolis' uh, presentation. He's thinking about the whole thing about being an actor. So let me tell you one quick story before we wrap up tonight, a little bit about how that might have impacted my job search. So when I was growing up in New York City, my, my, my mom's mom, my grandmother, was a longtime public school teacher in New York City. And when I was a youngster, said to my mom, don't put him in the public school system. So I don't know that it was a good thing or bad thing, but I ended up going to private school. So the first year I go into this one private school, goes from fifth grade through 12th grade. So I'm a fifth grader, first year in. I am given the privilege of being able to be in the Christmas play, the sixth grade Christmas play, because they did the Christmas play every year was the sixth grader as a fifth grader. So I had the opportunity to be, do my first acting opportunity as a fifth grader. It was one little caveat. It was in, first off, it was an all boys school. <laughs> And I played Mary in the Christmas play. <laughs> now, now, the other little twist to all of this, some of you may not know this about me, but I'm actually Jewish. <laughs> okay, so, and, and by the way, I actually gave birth to Jesus on stage. <laughs> and at the time, I asked the two people that were helping to direct this, one guy, back, actually, when I got to the sixth grade, they stopped and said, we should actually have a sex ed course and so here i am with the sex ed teacher and my i think it was the fifth grade teacher looking at them here i am the bare stage i'm going how am i going to give birth on stage and they sort of looked at me and as it turned out they had the the, the angels in front of me kneeling down singing the song and i was supposed to reach behind me and grab this baby jesus under this wood box that was behind me so here I am, they're doing the song, and we rehearsed all this, and I reach behind me, because I know at any point, when the song's over, the nurses are, the nurses, the angels, you know, probably I needed a nurse, right? I didn't ask them about a midwife, I, sorry, I wasn't that clever back then. But, so all the angels are going to get up and disperse, and I'm going, i got to get this baby out from underneath this wooden box. And I turn around, and I go to pull, and the baby won't come out oh. from the box. <laughs> and I'm pulling, and I'm pulling, and the song's getting ready to end, and I'm panicking, going, I I'm going to be in front of all of these people at the Christmas play with no baby. In front of me. <laughs> so I finally yank this thing, and I hear rip. And, I'm, and I have to be like ready for, you know, for when the angels stand up. I look down, and there's the New York Times round up in cord with the poor baby Jesus cloth all and I'm trying to cover poor baby Jesus up so and so I managed to get through that but I was looking down at the New York Times panicking that that was what all the audience would see as my baby Jesus now, now the wonderful thing with all of this is that there was a minister in the audience that came up and said Mal you did a wonderful job playing uh, playing Mary in the Christmas play so now you know why my job search took so long right? <laughs> on that note uh, thank you all for listening to my little story I'll turn the mic over to the media for uh, Travis. Shall we stand to honor God? Thank you, Lord, for your fantastic, marvelous gift. We love you. We worship you. Send us out by the breath of your spirit like thistle down. And wherever we sit, let us take the seed of your love with us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace now, henceforth and forever, amen.